Excited to be here filming another video. Uh, today we're going to talk about internal developer platforms, both what they are, why they're important, how to use them, what the value of them is. So super excited to be talking about all of that. Uh, and uh, let's jump right in. So I think when we talk about internal developer platforms, you know, where it actually starts to me is going back to DevOps itself, right? So when we think about DevOps, you know, I think lots of people defined it in many different ways. For some people, they thought about DevOps as we're sort of combining the role of developers and operators into sort of one sort of full stack role. I jokingly call this the sort of unicorn engineers. Um, you know, in my mind, that's never been the definition. I've always thought about it as you have two separate groups, developers and operators, and it's ultimately about that interface between them. How do these different groups work together? How are you empowering the developers? And what's the relationship, the interfaces between them? So if we take kind of a classic example, right? If we say the developers where most of the time their journey starts with typically writing the actual code. So they might be writing their application, you know, committing their source code. We have a version control system. You know, let's say GitHub as an example. So I'm writing my application. I'm committing it. Great. And then obviously I want to have sort of a dev test experience. So you know, almost the first thing you're going to do is connect that into your you know, CI CD pipeline. So now I have a CI CD pipeline. I might initially start using that to just do testing of my application, unit tests, integration tests, things like that. Over time, I'm evolving this thing to actually do builds of the application. So I might be you know, actually building Dockerized containers, pushing them to an artifact registry. But then ultimately, I want to connect my application at some point into a production environment, right? So my application needs to get deployed, right? Build it, test it, package as an artifact, and then ship it into production. And here's where I sort of purposely draw a massively expanding funnel, because here's where I tend to see an explosion of different tools, right? It might be that our developers are interfacing with systems like Kubernetes directly, right? And so they're baking that into their pipeline in terms of how they're deploying their application. It might be they're using tools like Terraform to build and deploy and manage the lifecycle of their application. It might be they're using things like Argo right, to do more sophisticated rollouts onto a Kubernetes platform. So there's a whole ecosystem of tools that might be used here that really starts at the end of the CI CD pipeline that's about taking the applications fundamentally into production. Now the challenge is it's not just about deploying the app onto Kubernetes or just you know, deploying a VM or a serverless function with Terraform. There's a full lifecycle management that's associated with these applications. So often there's a lot of different tools and services that we're using as well. So it might be, for example, we have you know, a vault environment that we're using to manage you know, the secrets that are used to you know, deploy our application or the actual database credentials the app needs once it's deployed. It might be that I have things like Datadog that I'm doing monitoring of my application. Right? I have dashboards, I have SLOs, I have SLAs. So I'm looking at these things and monitoring them as part of the deployment. Did things go well? Did it go badly? Do I need to do a rollback? You know, et cetera. I might even have things like PagerDuty, for example, to say, hey, if things go particularly badly, you know, maybe I should raise an alarm and somebody should get paged. Right? So the point is that very quickly you start to realize like, you know, development land tends to be relatively simple. Right? We have our version control system and our CICD pipeline. That's mostly what you need within the dev test environment. And then once we start to touch true production environments, you see the sort of explosion of tooling. Right? All of a sudden we're talking about you have to know about Kubernetes and Terraform and Vault and Datadog and PagerDuty and all of these other pieces to really be able to deploy the application. Right? And so that starts to touch in on the sort of ops side of the house. Right? Oftentimes it's the operations teams that are responsible for running these production environments and helping build these sort of pipelines that are sort of putting these pieces together. Now the challenge though is the developers are ultimately the consumers of this, right? So when we think about the app teams at the edge that are building their applications, they end up having to learn about all of these different pieces, right? So, you know, I think there's different, you know, some people would say, hey, if we collapse DevOps into one role and you just know all of these things, great. You know, I think there's, you know, some set of engineers that really want to know this and dig in and like to understand how the entire platform works. But I think there's a much broader audience for whom all of this is frankly a detail. Right? What they care about is, hey, I want to worry about the business logic of my application. I want to add capabilities to that. I'm fixing a bug, adding a feature. I don't really care how is my thing being deployed. Is it running on Kubernetes as a service function? It's sort of a detail to them. Right? As long as the app is running, that's what matters. So I think you start to then see, okay, well, there's different evolutions of organizational structures ultimately. And I've done videos sort of talking about that. You know, in my view, I think where a lot of organizations end up is you have this sort of a three-tier structure. You have your application teams at the very top. 
At the bottom, you have your core platform and SRE teams, right? These are sort of the, the hardcore platform operators that are building and maintaining. And then in the middle tends to be, you know, different teams will call this different things, right? You know, at a high level, I like to think about it as application supporting operations, right? So it's sort of an ops team that's closely aligned to the application team, tends to be still more of an ops profile, right? This is also more of an opsy profile, where up here is more of a dev profile. And you have this sort of three-layer cake, right? At the bottom, the SRE teams and the core platform teams are really saying, okay, how do we build and maintain and deliver this platform in a common way for everybody as a consumable service? Sort of regardless of the, you know, maybe specific applications, right? This team is sort of lean and mean, thinking about hundreds of app teams. But then obviously these app teams come in various levels of maturity, different requirements. They don't maybe fit perfectly into this. So you have some level of customization, some level of you know, hand-holding and maturity that's required. So this middle group, the application supporting ops, is sort of working in partnership embedded with these app teams right, to ultimately deliver it. So I think this ends up being a relatively mature operational model for it. The question then becomes, well, what is the ownership and what are the lines of demarcation, if you will, the sort of interfaces between these teams, right? What does that API actually look like, right? And so if I look at this example, you know, where's that line? It's sort of blurry where development ends. You know, clearly, yeah, version control system owned by the developers, you know, in terms of the content of it. But then it's like, okay, well, if I'm using Argo and it's part of my CICD pipeline, does the developer own the CICD pipeline? Is that part of operations? Who configures that? So you can start to see the messiness of this, right? So I think it was really starting with this that we start to say, okay, well, what's the role of an internal developer platform, right? So to me, when I think about an internal developer platform, it's really about that middle interface layer, right? So the internal developer platform sits in the middle and ultimately separates a set of concerns between the application developers who sit on top here, right? They're the sort of customer, if you will, right? Versus underneath the dotted line, what's a set of operational concerns, right? So they shouldn't have to care that, great, I have an app that runs on Kubernetes and we're provisioning things with Terraform and you know, I have secrets in Vault and I'm using you know, Datadog as my you know, monitoring solution and you know, yada, yada, yada. There's a bunch of things that fall below that line that's sort of an operational concern that most developers don't want to have to think about, right? They want to focus on their application, right? So this becomes sort of almost the dividing line between these things. The goal becomes, can we package up a set of you know, experiences and interfaces for the developers so that they can focus on what they want to do, which is really application lifecycle, and the operations teams can own the pieces that ultimately support and underpin that infrastructure, right? What's the point of this, right? Like, what's the benefit, right? Done right, it's really a few things, right? For the developers at the top, it's really a velocity question. Right? They don't want to have to care about all of these details. Right? I'm a new developer. I join HashiCorp. I want to develop my app. I don't want to have to learn 25 different technologies and how these things connect together to build my application. I want to focus on my app. I can go to my platform, push the deploy button. I don't have to care how it works underneath the hood. Right? So for me, it's really about unlocking velocity for my developers, letting them focus on what they care about. Now, for the ops teams below, it's really about consistency. Right? Because you could imagine letting every app team just do it their own way. And great, that's fine if I have one, two, five, ten app teams. But when I have 50, when I have 100, <laughs> it starts to become a problem, right? That lack of consistency creates a whole bunch of process nightmare for me around, you know, how do I optimize cost of cloud spend? How do I optimize risk that everything is compliant and secure? So the consistency becomes the goal for these platform teams, the benefits of which really become those, right? It's how do I manage my cost at scale, right? And it's how do I manage risk? Right? Now if I need to patch something because it's out of date, great, I have a consistent way of patching it across all of my customers versus every one of these app teams having done it a separate way. If I need to optimize and say, hey, we should really standardize on a particular instance class so we can do reserved instances around that, or we need to right size our resource utilization, great, I can do this in a consistent way, again, for everybody, rather than sort of every app is a special snowflake. Right? So this becomes kind of the goal, right? So the questions become, how do you actually build this, right? I think there's a few flavors, right? You know, one camp is a lot of people go down the route of, you know, DIY. They sort of home grow something, right? You're going to you know, build your own UI layer, build your own abstraction layer, you know, create your own custom abstraction, if you will, that's sort of tailored to your organization's needs, right? 
A lot of other folks will start with something you know, that gives them maybe some scaffolding, something like Backstage, right? Where you might start with Backstage and then start to customize that to effectively kind of build a DIY version of the same thing. And then you might start and say, great, there's other sort of more opinionated solutions, something like HashiCorp's Waypoint, right? Where it's a bit more of an opinionated approach to doing an internal developer platform, right? So I think there's a few different approaches. I think when you look at you know, what's sort of in the box with these, I think you often find that there is sort of a common set of capabilities regardless of your approach to how you do this. The first ends up really being you know, what I'll call service catalog. right? So the idea is great. If I'm a developer and I come into this platform, I just want to say, great, I want to build a new Java application. How do I quickly say new Java app running in GCP, hit save, right? and I don't have to think about it should create my you know, Version repo, it should create my CSCD pipeline, it should hook me up to what I need to deploy into a production environment. I don't want to have to think about that. And then I have a catalog of what are all those applications that I've defined. I can say application foo, bar, and baz are part of my service catalog. Right? So that ends up, I think, being the key starting point. From there, I think you quickly get into this idea of what we call golden patterns and golden actions. Right? And this goes back to the example I just gave with the service catalog. When I say new Java app, I want to define that Java app as part of a golden pattern. And when I say we, I'm meaning as an op ops team, right? So this is sort of the SRE platform groups or the applications supporting ops teams. They're defining what does that pattern mean when you say Java app. Okay, great. It means a repo that has this type of scaffolding. It means the CICD pipeline. It means we've already connected it up to Maven to build the image that goes to Artifactory. Here's how we package it as a container, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a definition of what is that golden pattern such that it's consistent across every user who says foo, bar, baz are all instances of the Java pattern. When I say actions, okay, well the pattern, if we say, okay, this is Java, for example, there's a set of actions that will be highly related to that, which is great, you know, I have a Java app, well, how do I build it? Okay, I need to have some way to build the jar, create the container, push it to Artifactory, et cetera. How do I deploy that thing? Okay, maybe I'm running it, you know, on Kubernetes, for example. Okay, so there's a deploy process a set of actions for it and then something goes wrong you know datadog's telling me you know i'm now 500 erroring all of my clients okay something's bad has happened i need an action that's a rollback you know to the last known good version for example so there might be a number of these actions that are associated with those golden patterns that we want to define centrally so that our developers focus on the thing they care about i come in i do my build i do my deploy things go wrong i do my rollback I can manage the life cycle I care about without really knowing the details of how it's actually operating, right? And then obviously, to really start to do some of this stuff at scale, you need things like role-based access control and policy management, right? To be able to say, you know, maybe you need an approval workflow to go to production or only certain, you know, development teams should be able to touch certain applications. So I want to be able to do that type of role-based access control and, and segmentation so it doesn't become kind of a free-for-all. Right? So these become, I think, the common wheel. From there, people will customize and do different things. Some people you know, extend their system to be a hub for documentation. Other people might embed things like you know, dashboards from Datadog in there, so they have SLOs and SLAs embedded within their, in, within their IDP. So you can kind of take it different ways. I think this tends to be the common wheel of capability because it's really focused on what does my developer need to unlock, you know, ultimately, you know, their set of patterns and their actions. And then from there, there's a bunch of other you know, adjacent things. So then if we think about you know, where does this sit in terms of sort of a maturity curve of you know, we're starting off with cloud adoption, do I start day one you know, with something like this or is this something that comes in day two or day three? What I tend to think about is you know, I think step one tends to be more of how do I lay a foundation for doing cloud? And this tends to be more basic things, right? Like do I have a practice of things like infrastructure as code, for example, right? If I don't have sort of a foundational approach to cloud where I'm defining things programmatically, doing it as infrastructure, as code, some of this is going to be difficult to implement, right? It's hard to talk about things like golden patterns if you haven't defined any patterns. <laughs> so you have to define some of these patterns, ideally in a way that's codified and repeatable. You're starting with sort of infrastructure as code. That becomes sort of a foundational approach. Then I think from there, I think it's about going from sort of the initial foundation to I'll call it sort of the early stage. Right? Or maybe this is your kind of early adopters of cloud within the organization. This might be the first, you know, call it dozens of applications, right? Where what we're trying to focus on is what is those patterns, right? Are all my applications Java? Okay, that's my main pattern. Are they all Python? Are they all, you know, single page apps in JavaScript? 
So I want to sort of have the first few apps so that I ha start to have a sense of what are the common patterns? What database systems am I using? What storage systems? What app patterns? What infrastructure? And I can start to look at that and say, okay, there's some dots I can connect. From that, you can start to say, okay, well, now I want to unlock sort of my, my next tranche. I want to sort of say, okay, well, what's my mature approach to cloud at scale? And this is going to be the approach I might want to scale to hundreds of applications or thousands, potentially, depending on how big your org is, right? And I start to think that it's at this third phase that it really makes sense to think about how do I implement an internal developer platform. I think at the early first two levels, it might be useful to think about it directionally just because you can kind of see where you're headed uh, and you can sort of see the pitfalls. But I think you, you've got to start by putting a foundation in place, defining the patterns, defining some of those best practices of, hey, we define infrastructure as code. We have automated pipelines for this stuff. Then you've got to run water through the pipes for the first few dozen applications to start to see what those patterns are. Right? And then over time, you say, how do I make that consistent and scalable? That's where I want to have this layer where I'm standardizing on the golden patterns, the golden actions, and making it simpler for that next group of users to come in without having to be experts. Right? So that's kind of how I think about it. There's a natural maturity curve, and I think the reason internal developer platforms have become sort of more in vogue in the last you know, few months till maybe last 18 months is really, I think, as an industry, we're starting to see folks mature through these curves. Right? Like, we're at a point where things like infrastructure as code really are a standard approach to how people think about building applications. And I think a lot of organizations are past that early adopt phase. They have the first handful of applications in cloud, and now they're really looking and saying, okay, great, how do I bring the rest of the developers, the rest of the applications along with me in a way that's ultimately going to be consistent and scalable rather than a thousand special snowflakes within the organization, right? So that's kind of how I think about it. I think it's a very natural part of the maturity curve. Um, and ultimately, for me, it really comes back to thinking about how do you think about making the development team successful? What's the role of the operations and platform teams? And what's the interface between the developers and the operations teams? I hope this video was useful. Uh, we'll have more content around internal developer platforms and the role of tools like Waypoint, so check those out as well.